Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I don't know if I'm dating myself with laser discs or just painting myself into a strange corner. Well, where you had to do the, like, pause forward frame to see the next frame of screen where it was the um the disc where it would play it was only a half hour on a disc as opposed to an hour because you could actually freeze frame everything otherwise if you paused it it would just it would just show you a blue screen <laughs> and they had these special features where you would it would be like like reading the script or looking at at production stills or something and it would it would go into this stage where 
it would pause it and say, okay, now begin stepping through. And you'd step through frame by frame to watch all of it or to read through everything or look at all the pictures. And if you hit play while you're in there, it just was like, <laughs> just like boop, speed boop, boop, images. Boop, 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 it was like, yeah, right. it, was, it was like a big subliminal message. <laughs> so those were the days. The, those were the days. 15 minutes later, flip the disc. Everybody should try a laser disc player at least once in their lives. Do you, do you still have yours, your player? I do. Does it still work? <laughs> it still works. I just can't actually connect it to a TV anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I can't remember if we talked about it, but when we were watching, uh, I feel like it, it was, uh, I think it was 12 Monkeys. Oh, that's that seems like that would be it. No, it was Fish, Fisher King. That's what it was. Because I was mm. listening to the commentary because there was a Criterion Fisher King. And at the time, there was only the DVD. There was no great edition and so i wanted to listen to the commentary on it so i had to play it but i could only <laughs> i could only play one video channel out of it or one of you know is the is the uh, rgb so you watched all the red channel so i just had like yeah <laughs> yeah so i just had one channel that i could play so it, it doesn't actually work to watch things you, like that anymore you, <laughs> you are a slave to the arts that's what they call that i guess that's what it is yep congratulations <laughs> <laughs> There's a plaque with your name on it, I'm sure. <laughs> it's a laser disc. Um do we have any uh follow up from our from the big uh, Captain America? I don't think so, but I think did, did it change your opinion? No, I still I still like it okay. Um but it did end up hitting at uh, opening weekend at 180 uh 180 million. So it was kind of right in line with the uh, Reduced shallower expectations, expectations, not the 200 million that they were initially so I don't know what that's going to do to its overall uh, uh, box office take, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it will still do just fine. It's just not going to be, uh, you know, beating Star Wars at the at the tough uh, tough to hit a billion dollars in two weeks. Yeah, that was a kind of a rare. That's thing. That's tough. Quick shout out, some really nice emails. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Ashford, from r- writing in to us from Shropshire in United Kingdom. Have you ever been to Sh- Shropshire? Am I saying that right? Shropshire? It sounds sounds good. I don't know. Shropshire. Isn't there also a Shropfordshire or is that just me? It's Worcestershire. <laughs> Worcestershire. <laughs> Worcestershire. So it's Worcestershire. Shropshire. So it's maybe Shropshire. I am a, I'm a hot mess when it comes to the shires. If it isn't just the Shire. <laughs> if it's right. If it's not involving hobbits. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a big mess. Your guess mess. is as good as mine. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Mr. Ashford, for writing in. We were so glad you found us. And he found us. You know, he found us. He was looking for uh, the Parallax View. Podcasts on the Parallax View. Uh, that is a very limited search term, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so I am thrilled that we ended up on the list of uh, results for the para- podcast on the Parallax View. And uh, that was a pretty good show. Remember it that? was. I remember, remember talking show? about it. Yeah. It was a good show. A lot, of, a lot of good stuff going on with that movie. I still enjoy it quite a bit. Now, this is in contrast to uh, an email that came came in uh, telling us what our first, uh, our worst film was. Mm. Did you catch that? We got a, uh, we got a worst, a worst episode. Which actually I love quite a bit. <laughs> well, because he's right. <laughs> he is right. Friend of the show, Nick Langdon uh, wrote in. To tell us that uh, that not only uh, has he been uh, following along with this, and, and he's celebrating his 100th film that he has watched that the next reel has covered. Uh, and he does call out friend of the show, Mr. Ben Lott, who uh, who's keeps up on all the films. He hasn't. He, he says this is not, I'll admit, dedication on the level of Mr. Ben Lott. But there are so many good films that I need to see. So perhaps I can survive without Under the Cherry Moon or Rush. Yes, you probably can, Mr. Langdon. Thank you so much for writing in. He's, he's doing really great. We'll put, you know, uh, we'll put a link. He's got a, a great list of uh, movies and flicks and uh, reviews. We'll put his, uh, his link in the show notes because he, he wrote it here. But what he says is, I guess in true fanboy fashion, I feel I do have to dub a comic book guy style worst episode ever because when people provide you with hundreds of hours of free entertainment, you have a right to judge them, he says. That makes me smile. Thank you, Nick. In that case, I'm compelled to nominate your episode on David Fincher's The Game, as you only talked about the movie for less than 30 minutes, mentioned Sean Penn only in passing, and completely overlooked Deborah Kara Unger and her very important role in the film. This episode also stood out, as you've had great conversations about movies that are far worse, Alien Resurrection and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, for example, which is probably your fault. <laughs> 
I know, and you know, as as a big lover of the game, it is I kind know. of funny that that kind of happened because I absolutely love that movie. So uh, I I feel like we should go back and re-record the episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our defense, it was episode number seventeen. At that point, I think we would both have been very surprised that anybody would be writing us in 2016 saying that they had listened to it. <laughs> I don't think that was in our plan at the time. We're not looking that far ahead. I think that's fair All to right. say. Should we tell the people where we're from? Yeah, where are we from? This is the next reel on Rashpixel.fm, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that right over there is Andy Nelson. Hello. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're kicking off our classic Fritz Lang series with his 1927 science fiction epic, Metropolis. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the brand new email newsletter, which is so new it has not even had a, a letter sent. Or you can find our show on your favorite podcast app or join us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you've ever dreamed of climbing out of your hole in the ground and falling in love with a robot woman, then you're just the proper lad for the next reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that. Since Games Master Stephen Smart has just started his 10-hour shift of moving the hands on the giant clock down in the basement, I'm here to fill in. This week, the winner was none other than Glarsed, who nailed it on Image 2 of 1971's fantastic, fantastic film Harold and Maude, directed by Hal Ashby, starring uh, Ruth Gordon and Bud Court. So congratulations, Glarsed. You are once again entered to win the 2016 Pony Prize hat. Andy, we had some follow-up, uh, and I think we did this one all right from uh, the good Mr. Ben Lott on the Blot Spot. Yeah, he said, you guys really hit the nail on the head with Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. It was a treat watching this movie. The opening scenes with all the fourth wall breaking narration were amazing and had me laughing a lot. My only issue with the movie was the middle section where the narration was less and the plot got a little convoluted. The film was a ton of fun, and the acting was amazing. Definitely the best in the Shane Black series. Your rank 17, my rank 24. That is exciting to see that he loved it nearly as much as we did. I love it. It's it, it, nearly a perfect Blot Spot score. That's, yep. uh, that's something to be proud of. Very much so. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. <laughs> All right, so I'm talking about Urge tonight, which, uh, you know, it looks like an interesting little movie. I'm not quite sure if I'm if this is something I'm going to seek out and go watch. But the thing that really got me excited about it was Pierce Brosnan playing this club owner who is uh, giving these uh, these kids this new designer drug that kind of strips them of their inhibitions where they kind of go crazy living their wildest fantasies. This drug called Urge is something that um, apparently you can only take once ever in your life because otherwise you you kind of your brain deteriorates and all you can do is is focus on getting more and living your wildest fantasies and ruining your life. And it looks like a little a little absurd, I will say, but it, Pierce Brosnan is an actor that I've always loved even when he's in really bad James Bond films. Um, I think that he is so much fun to watch on screen. And I love it when he kind of steps out and does something that uh, just feels a little different. I thought he was the reason to watch Matador. That movie, if you haven't seen it, was just so much fun to watch, mainly because he was this this hitman that he, I mean, he was perfect as that as that different character that was just so different from what he had been doing in the James Bond films. This character of this uh, this crazy this nightclub owner who's giving this strange drug to people again, he looks like he's kind of there's something else about him that I'm going to really enjoy. So um, the film. Also install uh, the film also stars some other faces of some younger people like uh, Justin Chatwin and uh, you know I, I don't know I think it looks uh, it looks interesting um, I, I again I just don't know if it's something I'm going to love but I think I could watch it probably as a rental not uh, theatrically but it's something I could watch just to see Pierce Brosnan in it What did you think of it Danny Masterson man. Danny Masterson was Stephen Hyde on that '70s show. He was the stoner, which makes it oh, man. so much more appropriate that he's in a movie about a drug you can only do once. I totally didn't place him. You're right. 
<laughs> that is funny. That was uh, that was a great. Uh, that's a great find. He's been in a bunch of other stuff uh, besides that '70s show. It's it's got to be frustrating to be pigeonholed to that show. But he has done a whole bunch of good stuff, and I think he's a fine uh, young actor. I like uh, I like his work, and so I also think that this is. This is one of those movies that is so formulaic. I mean, whenever you you hear somebody say, here's a drug, you're going to have the best time of your life, but you can only do it once. Um, it's it's just a recipe for, you know, the second act. <laughs> That's what yeah, happens right, when you do right. this drug. You get the second act. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know what to make of it. It's, it, it's really, it, it's good looking. It's really flashy and vibrant and it looks, it, it's got this super sort of avant-garde club feel. Um, that I think is is really interesting. Very symbolic uh, uh, production design from the from the looks of it in the trailer, uh, and so I'm I I like that part. And I, I I think that's my struggle with it. I I think that there's something there that could be interesting. Um, you know, with this group of uh, young kids who are going crazy partying on this island. But yeah, for me, it's really just the Pierce Brosnan thing that draws me. In. Yep. Yeah, no, I I should say, I I totally agree with you. I really really like Pierce Brosnan and and uh, he's just really fun, a fun iconic uh, actor. Well, this one's going to have a limited release um, June, starting June third um, here in the states, and it's also going out on the internet same day. So everybody should be able to start finding it then. My trailer, Andy. I think I I think I told you the story of my trailer. I we went to see Captain America. And uh, I sat in a different place than my children and their friend. I sat with my friend. They sat with their friend in a completely different place. And what is the first trailer that comes up? 2016's The Shallows. Blake Lively is a surfer who finds paradise. And paradise ends up being stocked with a great white shark. And it bites her. And the rest is Blake Lively playing the role of Roy Scheider trying to get to shore. Uh, it is one of those films that I thought I was going to lose my kids forever. That they they would have uh, they would be under the seat and miss Captain America. It turns out they did okay. And in fact, my daughter comes to me afterwards and says that Shallows looks pretty good. Oh. So we may be entering a whole new era. Wow. Of film watching if if we've crossed this crossed this particular line. So anyhow, uh, uh, Jome Colette Sarah. Uh, directs, written by Anthony Juzwinski, The Shallows, uh, stars Blake Lively and a couple other people who are eaten. <laughs> but really, that's it. Oscar Janeda, Brett Cullen, Sedona Lege, I don't know, people I've, I haven't heard much of. They don't, uh, they don't do well in this film. In fact, one of them plays like a harbor seal. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> thrown out of the water, playing the role of the seal, and is devoured in midair. Uh, the story, I think, is really fascinating. I think, uh, you know, it's one of those compressed uh, uh, stories. She's on a rock outcropping that is within uh, distance of shore. She can see it. She can swim it. Uh, but this, there's this giant shark in the way. Computers have come a long way. The shark looks really good. And, you know, we'll see if this is the answer to the question, would Jaws have been good if you could actually see the shark more? You know, we'll see. This this film, I think, proposes to answer it. What do you think? You know, it's funny that you bring up the whole Harbor Seal thing. Um, I just started uh, showing, uh, sitting with the family and watching Planet Earth. And uh, <laughs> that's the first place where they, they filmed that beautiful slow motion of that seal on the run from the shark. And the shark yep. finally... <laughs> finally is victorious as it flies out of the water eating that poor little seal and it was exactly what i thought i was like well these guys clearly have been watching planet earth <laughs> <laughs> oh it was so funny but i mean you know i don't know there's something about movies with sharks that i think um for the most part can be done really well and really fun again as i mentioned on our shane black series i wasn't a big fan of uh, rennie harlan's um, deep blue sea but for the most part, I really enjoy what people do with them. And uh, I think Jaws is you know, one of my top five films. This uh, looks like it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be as good as Jaws. I just, I know it, but it is going to be a lot of fun. And it is going to be a tense film to watch in theaters. And I'm all in. I think so too. Uh, it will hit us uh, June 29th. 2016. And it uh, looks like that's the open of the international run. It, it's uh, Spain, Finland, and USA that last week of June. 
through August, through the end of August, we've got about uh, 25 countries opening. Uh, that's where we'll see it. I assume because it's not a worldwide release uh, that we're going to see it pretty quickly on demand. So be on the it's lookout. an interesting, interesting. Uh, I guess you could say counter programming to the you know the Fourth of July weekend, which will be hot on its heels with uh, I guess Independence Day and some big alien stuff. Yeah, right, Andy. <laughs> Moloch. Nineteen twenty-seven. It's good year for Fritz Lang. You know there are a lot of great silent films. This one, I think, is a really has a really interesting place. I don't necessarily think it works uh, completely as a film itself, but I think there's just a lot of interesting stuff to talk about with this film. I think there's uh, a great visual style with this film. I think there's a lot that uh, Fritz Lang did, you know, pretty early in his career that's that's worth talking about. So to that end, I think that I, I, I'm glad that we're doing this one first. We are, of course, talking about Fritz Lang's 1927 Metropolis, written by uh, Lang himself and his wife, uh, who had written the novel Thea von Harbo. Uh, and she was a, a prolific writer and novelist in her own right. Uh, and uh, they were married for a time. The film stars uh, Alfred Abel, Gustav Froelich, Rudolf Kleinroge, Fritz Rasp, Theodor Luce, uh, Erwin Wiswanger, Heinrich Jörg, and of course, Brigitte Helm, playing the machine man, and Maria, the legendary character from this film. I think what this film is really known for, you said it, is, well, two things. First, the production design and the way that this film and the overall sort of story has inspired so much of science fiction uh, that has come after it. Not just science fiction, I should say, but but in terms of sort of activist filmmaking, this, is, this ends up being a sort of bullet point. Uh, but the other is the story of the film itself, from release to the cuts to lost footage to the story of finding the abandoned reels. I mean, it, it, it's a, kind of an amazing story that leads to the restoration of this film um, that I think is also worth talking about. So um, where would you like to start with a silent film? Um, you know, how would you like to frame the conversation? You know, I, I think it's worth just talking about the film itself, and then we can kind of move into what happened once it got released. All right, so let's start it with a, a story summary, shall we? Can you want to sure. start us out there? In a futuristic city, sharply divided between the working class and the city planners, the son of the city's mastermind falls in love with a working class prophet who predicts the coming of a savior to mediate their differences. I think that's that's in essence what the story is about. I, I You know, it's in a two and a half hour film, there's obviously a lot going on that one short little sentence doesn't sum up. But, I mean, that's ostensibly what it's about. When's the last time you'd seen it? Sometime within the last year. Okay, so you and, and which, it was the restoration, so you'd seen the complete film? I should say, I saw it sometime within the last year, which also was the first time I had ever seen this film. Okay, that's interesting. I'm actually surprised you you uh, this one had missed your film studies. I, yeah, watching, when I decided to watch it, I, I really wanted to see it uh, because... This was a film for some reason that in my silent film history class, we never watched. And we certainly watched, I mean, we had an entire semester of silent film. I would think, having watched this now, that this was one that we probably should have watched, but uh, for some reason we didn't. <laughs> There's <laughs> a don't... faculty member with a list of shame exactly one film long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that being said, there are an awful lot of short uh, silent films out there, so I, I I can't fault him too much. But I would have liked to see this. And you know, I my theory on on why he skipped Metropolis was because at the time, the best version of it out there was probably Giorgio Moroder's uh, musical version. And my uh, film professor was adamantly opposed to watching anything that was different from what the director had intended. And since that was kind of a re-edit in its own way of the film itself, he probably said, you know what, there's no good version of this film to show you and just skipped it. I can absolutely understand that because Maroder did some awful things to the film. <laughs> 
He did, but you know, he did and he didn't. I mean, I I did watch both versions in preparation for the show, and I will say, having never seen the Marauder version, I actually enjoyed it, and I watched it with the kids, and they actually enjoyed it. Yeah, Pat Benatar, Andy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very eighties. <laughs> it's very very eighties, but I still enjoyed it quite a bit. Metropolis, the the story of Metropolis. I mean, this is very much a, a class, a story of class. Uh, you know, we've the. And and it is a story of class that is driven by the the production design that tells you that it's a story of class. I mean, the film opens with these incredible long sequences of the workers marching in lockstep out at a, at a during a ten hour shift change, or I should say, after a ten hour shift during the shift change, they are marching toward these uh, giant uh, uh, elevators that take them up to their to the worker city. Uh, where they they live, they work, everything is below ground, and all of their work is to support the machines that support the heart machine, the machine that keeps the city above ground uh, working and alive and light. And and so the story above ground is a story of parties and frivolity and fun, and uh, eventually that spirals into debauchery and uh, lechery, and uh, you know it, it's a story of of all that is uh, you know that is wrong with this society. So in very much in in, in many respects, it's a story of kind of the impression of of capitalist uh, capitalism gone awry. Uh, it, it, and um, you know all of the, the the benefits when when the people work together and all of the people have uh, share in the rewards story of sort of the communist um, uh, communist ideals uh, and and also where that goes awry so it, it's a very critical film in a lot of respects and I found myself surprised I had seen it some years ago I, many years ago and I didn't give it a lot of credit frankly because I didn't see the restoration I didn't see I mean it was just a mess like I, I didn't get the story um, I certainly didn't get the story quickly and so I didn't give it much credit I didn't like really pay attention to it and so I, I just had kind of a, a sour memory of it and I was always sort of puzzled about why people thought this was such a great film um, but but I think it has a lot more to say, and I think one of the things that's really powerful in it is just how much of a story of classism and uh, a critique of political system they're able to pack into a two-and-a-half-hour silent film with remarkably sparse interstitial titles. Yeah, it is it is very interesting the way that they tell this and, and what they do get across. And, and, you know, I think that there's an interesting element to... The third part of the story. I mean, you do have the the upper class. Uh, I mean, the the thinkers. They call them the thinkers, but uh, really, we see them. You know, I mean, they're athletic. We do see them kind of doing things that seem a little more uh, than just partying. Um, but the, then we definitely see them devolving yeah, into by the, the third game. act. Really well, it's but south. it's really it really boils down to um, the the robot, right? The machine man uh, as Maria drawing them into this world of debauchery. That's right, which which I think is a story. So the the okay, so talk about how that happens because I think that's important. And that's and that's what I want to get to with this third element which really falls on the shoulders of Rotvang, the uh, the mad inventor. Um, I guess we can call him a mad inventor. He looks that way. Oh, yes. I don't think uh, you know, he's he's obsessed with um the uh, the deceased wife of uh, the founder of the city, Joe Frederer and the mother of Freighter. Uh, her name is Hell. He's obsessed with her and and jealous that uh, Joe Freighter ended up with her and he didn't. And he wants to create this machine man in her image. And, um, and he ends up not doing it because Joe kind of asks him slash commands him to create it in the in the image of Maria, this kind of prophetess from the underground, so that he can change the minds of the people underground it's it's very confusing this is where i I end up having problems with the story because if he did not do that she was already doing a good job as she was of keeping people at bay and just working as they were you know like if she if she uh, if he did not replace her with the robot, the people would have just been fine, just placated and moving along without having had any uh, reason to kind of revolt. Um, when Rotvang, who ends up 
as the guy who controls this robot, he ends up basically doing what Joe Freighterer wanted, which is inciting these riots underground so that these people revolt so that he can then attack and destroy them, which is... I don't know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they are kind of keeping the city running. I don't fully get why that happens. Regardless, this mad inventor also has her appearing at the clubs up on uh, uh, in the city as essentially like the uh, the whore of Babylon and luring all of these men to uh, to just you know sinful thoughts and and fighting each other and killing each other over her. And basically, he's, you know, weirdly, Joe Freighterer doesn't seem to have any problem with that, even though I, I, I don't understand that. There's more story problems um, throughout this. But it is an interesting third element of how he creates this this robot woman to essentially create discord in all parts of the city and really drive both sides to uh, to fall apart. So in, in a strange way, this is this guy. And some people claim that he's an occultist. There are so many theories about this film. This is another interesting thing about it is it's, it's really interesting to just read about all these different thoughts people have. But he's kind of like this mad scientist occultist guy who's really almost like trying to bring down society in a, in a weird way in both sides. It's as if Nothing is the way that he feels it should be, and so he's going to destroy it all. And in the end, it's it's Freighterer or yeah, Freighterer who kind of defeats him and it brings everything back, as really just to the way that it was in the beginning. The social story is about how easily the the riots occur, right? How easily they are wooed by these um, you know superficial desires. Right, how easily that the the um, you know the workers fall apart under the weight of the demands that they perceive are being put upon them, and how easily the the uh, upper class is dis- distracted by the needs of the flesh, and nowhere in the middle is there the heart. Right, that's kind of the social lesson, and that the the heart and that's the the mission of the film that between the head and the hands is the heart and you know without the heart everything falls apart um so i don't know that i gave a whole lot of thought to the story problems that you uh, that you point out i think you're right i <laughs> there's a lot of that stuff that doesn't end up making sense like maria is in a lot of places at once um right. and and that's that's a little bit frustrating the but robot more, Maria. The robot Maria. But more than anything else, you know, when she comes up, finally is revealed as the the woman at the um, at the tip of the statue of the the tower that rises up on stage, and everybody is is going crazy with their hands. And at the same time, real Maria is trying to you know push the uh, that lever to stop the flooding. I guess is that what that lever was for? So it's, what, it's to signal everybody to bring them out of their houses. To yeah, the, okay. To the courtyard so that she can get everybody to follow her, I think. And so we have this wonderful parallel of the children. You know, she's trying to Pied Piper the children out of the flooding city. And so all of their hands are reaching up to her while all of the uh, crazy, um, you know, industrialists up in, in the, the upper world are, are craving after the same her, but now robot her. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a really interesting parallel and a, a social commentary that he's trying to make. It's it's tough. It's long to to get to that. Like it's a it's a long film, uh, and I wonder my my sort of maybe superficial impression of it is that it's overlong for its for the platitudes that are uh, tossed upon it. Yeah, but that being said, I find it really watchable. Uh, like with all of the story problems I have, and I just, I mean, I have constant story problems. There's so many things that just don't make any sense as I watch this story. But that being said, I actually feel like, again, I've never seen the short version of it like you have, but um, other than the Marauder version, but uh, the I, there's something with this longer version and the way that it ends up. It's this interesting um, fascist story about this society that... In the end, it's designed where everybody is okay with being in the place they're in as long as there's this understanding and there's this emotional connection between all of them, right? That I thought was kind of interesting. And I I don't necessarily agree with kind of what they're saying, but I do feel that there was a a, uh, an interesting uh, story being told here 
from these people at this time in Germany in the 20s as Nazism is slowly growing and developing. I think it's very interesting to to note that, you know, especially Thea von, von Harbo, um, who really kind of sided with the Nazis as uh, as time progressed. And one of the I think that's one of the reasons that that Fritz ended up divorcing her and kind of fleeing Germany and going to the US um, because he was not wanting to be a part of that party. Uh, and and I think that's also another reason why later in his life he dismissed the film. He says he didn't like it. He he didn't really agree. He thought the story was very simplistic. And um, I, I think later, even later in his life, he he said he could kind of start finally understanding the, the you know the heart connecting the hand and the head as he I think it was around the sixties or so when he could see the youth of the time and how they were kind of that heart. And um, it, things, I think, made a little more sense to him later in his life. Uh, I don't know if he ever ended up really liking the film. I don't know. For me, I think, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here because of the time in which it was made. Yeah, no, I agree with you. But this, is, this gets all the way back to my question about which version have you, had you seen. And you had seen the Marauder vo- version, so you knew what was missing. And that, I think, is really important. There is a parallel story to the split of Maria, right? Maria goes up, Maria is down. But in the two classes, there's a parallel story here with the son who... Uh, who trades places with a worker. So the worker goes up top and he goes down the bottom to run the clock uh, or the, the not the clock, but whatever the arms were. And so he takes a role as the worker. That parallel story is part of the footage that was missing. It was like a hole, a narrative hole that we we didn't get. I think the the overall film works much better with that, those questions answered, you know, how how does the the son w- become the mediator ultimately? How does he transcend both the workers because now he understands the workers and his father because he'd been under the thumb of his father, you know, all his life, um, you know, and and there's that that sequence of the sort of proposed, I guess, arranged marriage or there's maybe is a setting him up with a prostitute i don't know yeah uh, <laughs> what was that is <laughs> the dance with the with the nymphs in the trees in the beginning i don't know but um in any case so he has experienced both of these worlds and he then transcends all that to become the mediator between the head and the the um hand. the hand the employer and the employee uh and he does it all with a silent and knowing nod and a handshake yeah, so, like, a, like I, a good union leader. Like a good union leader, right. <laughs> He's a union leader. Uh, he ended up buried in the end zone. Uh, anyway. <laughs> So the um uh, so it's it it's a much more interesting story that and I think that the 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 social piece that I like so much is definitely the story below ground because we really do see that the heart of the machine is the human hand right I mean none of the th- there are some beautiful sequences there's a beautiful sequence when we meet the heart machine the first time and we have this incredibly I mean it's a gorgeous machine a giant machine first of all multi stories and on every story are six people and these people are turning dials and moving knobs and they're doing so at this wonderful lock rhythm uh, and it you see this incredible uh, marriage of flesh and steel that I think is it, it tells the story that I think Lang wants to tell in just a few sequences better than than much of the rest of the film certainly the climax of the film ever does. Yeah, it's it, it's. Uh, I mean, I definitely agree with you. I definitely agree that this is um, some some lengthy storytelling here. I, I'm actually really curious uh, to go back to some of Fritz Lang's earlier films, and because uh, I mean, some of them are like five or six hours long, and I'm yeah. curious to kind of watch some of those to see exactly how uh, how his longer storytelling holds up. I mean, I actually I enjoyed it. Um, I I do think. Despite all problems that I have, it does kind of weave a little web on me, and I, I find myself rather engrossed in it. So, uh, Alfred Abel, Alfred Peter Abel, uh, plays the role of Joe Friderson. How did he do for you? I thought uh, I thought he did a great job. He's I mean, the big boss. I I should say I think he does a great job. There's something about him that I struggled with. I think. 
initially watching the film because there's something about his look that comes across as very kind of quietly compassionate, <laughs> which he's not. <laughs> and I, you know, in a silent film, it's it's kind of hard to read sometimes. And I I, I think that the subtext with his character and some of his looks, I, I just he he just looks a little nicer than he really is. And I, I don't think that's anything I can really fault. Um, but I, I, I like him as this guy who's, who's kind of the, the brains of, of Metropolis and who kind of runs this whole thing. It, you know, it's interesting seeing him and then Freder as his son, um, played by, uh, Gust- Gustav, Gustav Froelich, yeah. who is, uh, who <laughs> interestingly worked in vaudeville, and was employed as an extra on Metropolis before uh, before Thad von Harbo recommended him to Fritz Lang, and uh, you know he is you know speaking of coming from vaudeville, he is a very big emotional sort of actor, and he's the sort of actor that you see in silent films and go, oh, this is a silent film because that's silent movie acting. It's very big, over the top sort of acting, and I think he embodies that. I don't think it's quite so much there um, uh, that Abel uh, brings to the screen. His is a quieter role, a little more serious role. But I think some of it's there, especially as we get to the ending, as um, you know, he's you know concerned about his son up there on the cathedral roof and stuff. He's definitely not a stereotypical uh, silent film actor. Right. And this role, I mean, it's it is stoic. And, you you know, I've come to expect that kind of sort of over the top theatrics and the vaudevillian kind of theatrics in silent film, because that's what sells it. Right. And and in this, I think he his his uh, stoicism actually kind of sells the role even better. He is unthreatened. He is undaunted. Right. He is not uncertain about anything that he uh, anything that he takes on. And his his buddy, his thug, the thin man, uh which I'm, I am made to wonder if the Thin Man is supposed to have been inspired in it by any, uh, in any way, shape, or form in Dashiell Hammett's books, which uh, uh, I think they're three years apart uh, between the film and and the first book. Mm. I don't know. Thought that was interesting. Anyway, so to see them work together and the way they sort of manage the city uh, and then come into contact with the crazy, crazy mad scientist uh, Rotwang, played by Rudolf Klein Roga, uh, I think it's it is really fun to see them together because Roga is such a yang to uh, Abel's yin, uh, and and I think it makes for a, a great set of sequences whenever they are on screen together. Klein Roga had been, I think this was his fourth film with Lang after Destiny, Dr. Mabuse, The Gambler, and Die Nibelungen. So um, they had worked together. And actually, Abel had worked with him before in Dr. Mabuse as well. I really like uh, Rudolf Klein Roga as uh, Rotwang. There's something really sinister about him. There's something that I think he brings to the table in this. In, it is kind of an over-the-top mad scientist way, but... Like so many things in this film, you can see where people pull from, right? And that's what I really love about this. And I know Frankenstein had been written long before this film was made, but I do feel like there was some um, work pulled by the filmmakers of the movie Frankenstein just to create the laboratory, um, you know, from... Uh, from Rodvang's laboratory to uh, Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory. And like, I, I feel like there was just, uh, and that's what's so exciting about watching this film is just seeing so many elements that have been pulled from it to create other things all through uh, film history. All right. I mentioned the thin man, uh, Fritz Rasp played the thin man, uh, the big, uh, the big O thug. He's great. Uh, another incredibly long set of credits. And you know, we all of these people that we've been talking about successfully made the transition between silent films to sound films. Right? I mean, that that can't be understated enough because that's a giant just it was just a train wreck for so many actors. Right. Uh, right. And these guys, I mean, here it, here we are uh, with uh, Fritz Rasp, who ends up making films well into the 70s, uh, or making uh, certainly working on television well into the 70s with 119 credits. Alfred Abel ended up uh, working, well, actually, he's the one who didn't work that much longer, uh, but most of that's because he died in 1937, uh, but with 139 credits. 
uh, Gustav Froelich uh, ended up with 110 credits making uh, making moving pictures into the late 70s, uh, 1980 was his last work. So, I mean, these people made the the leap, and and that's noteworthy. Well, and I think what's interesting to note, I, I didn't do much research on this, but it is interesting to note that this film was very popular by uh, by some key uh, Nazis, right? Uh, some of the the big guys, uh, including Hitler, um, did find this film to be a a very interesting story worth uh, worth talking about and worth using to kind of uh, tell their or to spout their propaganda their propaganda yeah and um some of these actors stayed in germany and kind of were welcomed by the party and stuff and and i i think uh gustav is i don't want to say a prime example of that but he certainly was busy in germany all through um everything going on and, uh, you know, he was a, a very popular male star. And um, he, I, I think that he had somehow avoided the Nazi propaganda enough so that he was able to kind of continue his career after World War II. But that's, you know, it's an interesting time for a lot of German actors. And I think some of them um, may have created a, a better career for themselves because of the the rise of Nazism, and uh, some of them ended up falling because of that too. Um, luckily, I, I don't think Gustav necessarily uh, ended up having a, a downfall in his career because he kind of stayed away from that. And I, you know, probably as we know, it's probably for the best that he did do that. Interesting to uh, Brigitte Helm, uh, who played Maria. Uh, her last film was in 1935, uh, but she also did make the transition into into sound. Uh, she just didn't work all that much. After. Well, she she married a, a Jew. Definitely a defining cultural stance uh, in the period. Pretty interesting. Yeah, she moved to Switzerland uh, in 1935. That was pretty much it for her. Interestingly, she was actually considered for the title role in Bride of Frankenstein before Elsa Lanchester uh, was given the role. <laughs> Uh, only German actress to date mentioned in In Memoriam during the 69th Academy Awards. That is interesting. Yeah. For the most part, the actors that they cast worked well in the parts that they played. So, you know, I liked them. I, I think they all did a good job as these roles. And um, it was fun to see... It was fun to see them. I don't think I've seen any of them in any other films. I need to catch up on more of my Fritz Lang films and see more uh, Klein Roga because I really enjoyed him as Rothwang. Yes, I agree. And the other was Grote, the Guardian of the Heart Machine, Heinrich George, uh, that I liked uh, quite a bit. Um, he was he was just sort of a brute, uh, but yep. but the brute who was the heart of the heart machine. You know, he was. Right. It, that, that's one of the things I like so much is that you even get in the silent film, you even get the sense that he is so passionate about his work, and and treats it as his art. And and that was a that was a, a noted and and well seated place in in the film in the narrative. So I like that a lot. One one stumbling block I had with the story in regards to Grote was that uh, as the foreman, he has this relationship already with Frederson. Um, he's the one who Frederson calls up. Uh, to kind of talk about, um, hey, you know, these workers are, are you know, the, they're they're having these secret meetings. What's this? What's this map that that I keep finding everywhere? You know, they're having these conversations already, and they, he talks to him about the accident that happens and everything. It, he's like his point of contact with the people. Um, but like in the beginning scene when we see the two of them together, Grote really seems like he's kind of freighters guy on the inside of yeah. the like he's his connection you're, already so you're saying he's he is already the mediator that yeah, we've been so, searching for right. the whole and, time. And, and he works for the heart and he runs the heart machine so the you know the mediator is the heart between the hand and the head he's running the heart machine he already seems like he's set up for this role and I felt like when we get to the end, and Grote is the guy who who has to be mediated with uh, between uh, Freighterer and and the 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 hand side of things. I kind of didn't feel that he was the right character for that. It's like these guys were already part of the same team. I, you know, it was just weird for me that he was the guy that uh, that became the the head of or not the head. It's bad to mix my analogies here. He's the, the the person who is at the forefront of 
the hand, right? Yes. He's the thumb. He's the big toe. He's the Sergeant Hulka. <laughs> I uh, no, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. It does. It is strange, and it is even more strange when we see just how he breaks when he's trying to tell the people, "Don't destroy this. You're going to flood your own city. Why are you doing this to ourselves?" You know, yeah, right. he is so heartbroken, so visibly heartbroken that uh, that you're right. That he's he's the broken heart uh, of the heart machine already. Um, d- let's talk a little bit about getting it made. Um, the the cinematography is the thing that I feel like I'm I think about the most the things that I I saw in the film that felt like firsts to me the you know for example Doom Cam anytime you <laughs> right. have the first person film shot of the hand uh, and I think that's Fritz Lang's hand oh uh, is it well I don't know so I found this interview with him and he he says did you know I always have a hand in every... Uh, there's always a shot of my hands in each of my films. I did not... A, I did not know that. B, I was looking for hands everywhere, and those were the only places that I found hands not attached to a recognizable person. So anytime that the, the camera goes first person, like he's reaching down to grab a scarf, it felt like uh, it, that, that might have been Lang's hands. And that was a great shot, too, because of the movement in that shot and how the camera shoots toward the door with the hand and it just flies in there. And that really stood out as uh, just kind of exciting uh, filmmaking. Yeah. It's like, it's on, it's on rails. It's fast. The focus is right on. Everything is great. And the camera and the hand don't waver at all. Right. That's, that's hard to do. This is Carl Frund and Gunther Rittau as the two cinematographers for this film. Um, I thought they brought a lot to the table. There's a lot of great darkness. There was a, a lot. Another scene that really stood out to me is just something that's exciting to watch in the land of cinematography is when Rotvang is stalking Maria after um, she's kind of done her little um, speech to the masses and everybody departs. And he is now stalking her in the darkness with a flashlight as she's kind of fleeing through this this you know, cavern trying to escape him and just really beautiful stuff going on in there. And really creepy. beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. But in, combined with the cinematography, the effects, Eugene Schuftan, uh, it, you know, did some amazing stuff to make this, you know, at least appear to work. And it really appears to work well, you know, when you're when you're kind of munging together and com- doing this such early in-camera compositing of miniatures and mats and live action and stop motion and all of these different techniques throughout this film. And um, uh, I think it's, it's really fantastic in particular. And this is one that stood out to me, uh, the video phone sequence, the first time they actually, right. he, he calls himself, and that was, uh, Lang says... Uh, of this, uh, it was done by projecting a part of the film shot previously in the rear of a telephone apparatus across a translucent screen, one foot by two. This was the very first rear projection and the first transparency on film in Metropolis. Right. And it looks really good. That's when Frederer calls uh, yeah. Gr- Grote. Right. Yeah. yeah. Face- it's uh, the first FaceTime, too. Yeah. It's it's brilliant. It's it's a wonderful moment. Um, Schuftan uh, really kind of worked with mirrors, and he invented something called the Schuftan sequence or Schuftan process, which uh, has been used as recently as the Lord of the Rings: The Return of the King, which really surprised me. Wow! Um, I, I'm guessing it might be when involving some of the uh, bits where they're making people look bigger and smaller in the same frame. Yeah, yeah. But his process was used in some of the amazing model work in this when you have these incredible skyscrapers and buildings and these crazy bridges. And then you have people running across the bridge that are real people in this, like, you know, the little tiny people running across the bridge. He would um, put like a 45 degree angle plate of glass in there that's a mirror. And then that would reflect. You know, they would set it up in such a way where you'd have this amazing miniature, but then with this little mirror, it was reflecting something off the screen, and they'd have people do the action over there, and it would reflect that, and they could film it, and it looks like these people are actually running on the bridge. It's just, it's really fascinating uh, filmmaking, and the fact that um, they're coming up with this stuff at this time, I mean, it's, it's beautiful, uh, amazing uh, special effects work. I love this particular story about developing the film, uh, and it made me think of you. 
in particular, uh, dealing with developers and um, and labs. <laughs> so uh, Lang says, you know, we had done all this work, and in order to make it look right, uh, we, you know, we had to tell the lab, the technician at the lab, uh, you know, to develop the film normally because, you know, just don't do anything that you would normally do. Don't pay any attention to focus because we focused at a different point in the focal plane in order to make the stuff that needs to look small look like it's in the distance. And, and instead, it's actually in the foreground, but it's tiny. And so, it, you know, we, we've changed the focal plane. We don't want you to correct for that. And the technician knew that. He saw that coming. But the laboratory head, uh, you know, knew that this was a big film and he wanted to make it right. And so the lab head uh, went ahead and developed it himself without talking to the technician and developed all of the film incorrectly uh, with the wrong focus point and corrected for it. And so the scale was completely destroyed. And Lang says, I tried to keep my calm. These things happen, my children. I said, let's start again. And we did. Brings back painful memories. How much does that suck? So much. (laughs) That is really, it's always a painful thing. Yeah. At least it wasn't one of their... uh, Um, stop motion animation sequences. They had a stop motion animation sequence that they filmed. I believe it was with some of the vehicles moving through one of these models where it took them eight days to film moving all these little things. The cars and planes, right? Yeah, right. And it, it, it was 10 seconds of film and it took them eight days to do it. That is bananas. The one that impressed me even more than that, though, because I can kind of wrap my head around stop motion. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I know it's it's time consuming and it's an it is definitely an artist's uh, realm, right? I, I get yeah, that. Right. Very patient. I don't do it. But the concentric rings around Maria, right? This early masking and compositing of the light rings moving up and down around her that blows my mind right now today. It's uh, it, that is stunning, and I actually didn't realize. I, I guess in my head, I knew that they would go in and draw on on films, and they would kind of manipulate it by actually, you know, just going in and and scratching the print and stuff. For some reason, in my head, I had it that that's what they had done on this that they actually drew those rings on. Which you know, when you look at how smooth they are, it doesn't make any sense. So it was just me not understanding. <laughs> Movie magic from the twins, <laughs> but but what they what they ended up doing was they actually shot a silver ball uh, moving in a circle on I guess a track against black velvet, and then composite that against the film. I I don't I they just super it's just all done through superimposition. That's I guess amazing. that's bananas. I I didn't quite get that. It blew my mind. The other thing that I I actually had already written you about because I was confused about this. It turns out that I found out later, and I'm sure you're going to correct me on this technicality, that this film should have been restored and played at 20 frames per second, somewhere between 18 and 20 frames per second, rather than the standard 24. Uh, And that's why it makes them look intermittently like everybody on screen is moving too fast. Talk about that. Yes, I guess. Uh, it's, It's a tricky thing, the whole world of silent filmmaking, because they did not have cameras that that actually ran at a consistent speed. They were all hand-cranked cameras, and so everything kind of ran as fast as the person would crank, and they'd kind of count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, as they would turn the handle just to kind of keep a consistent speed. And then they would, you know, the projectors would kind of project back at that speed or would be, I don't know if the projectors were hand-cranked also or if they just kind of projected, but... Because of that, they everything was really kind of filmed somewhere between like 12 and 22 frames per second, somewhere in there. It was, it was a very rough thing. Um, a lot of times they didn't just, there wasn't that consistency. Now, it says that they filmed this at 20 frames per second. I'm not really sure if that was just kind of in the counting as far as they were they were guesstimating it was about 20 frames per second. But everything was slightly off. Now, when, now 24 didn't really get pinned down until the sound era kicked in and they needed a consistent uh, speed for the sound to always match. And so that's when 24 um, was locked in. And that was really kind of the, 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 uh, the slowest a film could run in order for the sound to actually work well. So they locked it in at 24 and 
everything kind of was moved up to 24. So all of these silent films that had been a little bit slower than that, when they play now, it just looks a little sped up because of, um, because of that slight difference in the frame rate. Yeah, uh, it says that uh, the note a note was found from Gunter Rittau, the cinematographer, and said that the stop motion effects, in particular, all of the cityscape effects, should be shown at twenty frames per second, as that's how they were shot. Now, if anything, you know, when you're shooting one frame at a time, that's that's just a straight up calculation. That's not a hand crank. So, if anything, should be sort of metered around, uh, you know, replay speed should be by the, the stop motion stuff, right? Well, the the challenge is when you're when you're locking it in and you're dropping it in and you have twenty four frames of it, it's hard to to match. You know, say okay, well, let's just play twenty seconds of that or twenty frames of that in this second. Yeah. Um, and so they they do have this thing called stretch printing where they can kind of stretch the time a little bit and and try to make these things kind of match that time a little bit. I don't know if I've ever actually seen anything that has been stretch printed. I know it's something that they can do. Um, I, but I haven't seen anything about them having done any of that with this print um, because it's, it's a manipulation. They have to kind of slowly somehow kind of create um, four extra frames out of those 20 frames. They have to like double four of them, right, in order to kind of build... Right, uh, build it, and so it, it could create kind of a weird little stutter. Stutter, and, yeah. yeah. And so it's it's a, I don't know, I don't know how effective it is, but I know that people have tried playing around with it to try creating silent films that look a little more natural. Yeah, it also makes them longer. <laughs> right, and a right. two and a half hour film, you know, I don't think we want to lengthen it too much more. Well, and and some of the blame, I think they try to sh- to shoulder uh, shoulder the blame right on to Gottfried Huppert's the composer, um, the original score, who whose notation was that it was all uh, scored around twenty four frames per second. It should be, you know, the score should be aligned. But that's a technicality, if I'm understanding you right. Like that's where he he scored to twenty four frames because that's what they needed to play the sound against. Yeah, which is. I guess that's entirely possible. Well, what did you think? What did you think of the score? If anything, is a, a massive challenge of creativity. Uh, it's coming up with two and a half hours of music over silent black and white film. It's a lot of music. It's a lot of music. But I actually really like the score. I think it's great. I think he did a great job. I, some of the themes are strong. Um, I like that he does tie in um, some um, bits of music that uh, that are already familiar, uh, like the the traditional D.A.C. Ray uh, plays in there. I believe, I can't remember if it's in the cathedral or when he's looking at the seven deadly sins, but we hear a little bit of that going on in there. There's a little bit of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture that kind of comes up toward the end. I, I mean, it's it's manipulated into the score. It's not like their score, their music straight up. There's some um, there's some other um, bits that he pulled from other uh, classical pieces throughout there. But I think for the most part, it's it's original, and he does a really good job of creating the emotional elements and the uh, and the really carrying this film. I think I think what Huppert's does here and this this score uh, conducted by uh, Frank Strobel for the 2010 reconstruction, I, it's beautiful. I mean, I think he does a great job with it. Gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I will say the Marauder version, I actually really like his themes too. I know it's a totally different version. I know it's 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 for some people it's much maligned the version that uh, Marauder created in 84 um but i think his music is great i think his score it's a very interesting electronic score that actually is an interesting fit with a film about uh kind of this this robot that's created i guess it, i mean yeah i mean it's it definitely um it, it definitely aligns with the subject matter yeah and the gestalt and and the 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 kind of the the uh, you could almost say maudlin story that comes up with you know the the heart is the thing that connects the hand and the head i mean it's it's a tad schmaltzy yeah. but the songs the 80s songs really are too and so that's why i think they fit it's a weird amalgam of all of that stuff happening that i actually kind of liked plus the colors that he uses i mean he tinted it he had seen some tinting done in some um, images and so decided to tint it and he added some uh interesting elements like there's like for example the um the track scene when they're having the little race um 
he he basically animates the sky that's going on above them. And so he does some things in there that I was like, you know, it's it's a weird art project is kind of how I viewed the film, but I, I don't know. I really liked it. I still prefer the, uh, the original, or I guess the quote original version that we've seen restored here, but um, I, I still look at it as an interesting, fun exploration. The dance scene on the Marauder uh, version in particular is really insane. Going from the blues to the pinks to the and and it just it looks like weirdly it looks like it was made that way, right? It does. Like I mean, when it switches around to the all the eyeballs and mouths, you know. I mean, it really could have been made that way. Silent films often tinted their films, so it makes sense that uh, that it could look that way. So, um, yeah. So I I don't fault him in playing around with this, and I mean he justified the whole thing. People saying, "How could you do this to?" Um, to Lang's original film. And he's like, you know, I'm not doing anything to a film that hasn't already been uh, drastically destroyed by the hands of time. You know, I mean, he's, he says there, there is no original vision of what Lang was trying to do here. So he didn't feel like he was ruining Lang's film. Yeah. Especially with silent film. I, I actually, I, I, I think I could fairly say, only with silent films. There's this interesting trend in all these different composers to write new scores for the films. I mean, we've got Philip Glass did a score for the Dracula film, and I believe he's done it for some other silent films. There are a lot of you know interesting composers and and orchestras doing these interesting scores for like electronic scores or or just you know limited like a you know a quartet doing a score for a silent film. It's the same thing. You know, it's it's other people taking their art and creating something that goes along with this silent uh, piece. So I, I think that it's okay. I, you know, I like generally, if somebody's doing that, that the original also be available. So at least you still have that. Um, if Marauder's version was the only version of Metropolis out there, I might have a little <laughs> more problem with it. But the fact that the original is there too, I guess I just don't have any problems with it. Marauder looks like a just a kick version of Burt Reynolds in his day. In his day. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Uh, there is a, a documentary called The Fading Image, uh, Giorgio Marauder, The Fading Image. It's a documentary about the German silent movies of Murnau and Fritz Lang. And uh, in it, he talks all about the, his research on the Metropolis footage and how he made the score. So that's one for the show notes. Yeah, there's a great uh, that is great, and also the uh, the full documentary I can't remember what it's called that comes with the restored version um, that's about an hour long talks about the whole restoration is also really interesting. Awesome! I did not see any of that because I watched it on Hulu, uh, but it was the Kino Lord Lorber uh, full restoration. It is really gorgeous and when you look at the marauder version side by side with it and and can see just how beautiful most of the new footage or or i should say most of the original restoration is uh it's stunning it's stunning that this stuff was made in 1927 yeah and i mean that's even with the um i mean now, I guess now is a good time to talk about some of this restoration. You know, a huge chunk of this film had been lost for years. I mean, they when they originally showed this film, it was about 153 minutes, and then immediately afterward, the uh, the UFA, the studio, and Paramount, who is uh, I think um, the U.S. side of the the uh, funding for this, said we've got to cut it, and they hired. A, uh, a playwright to chop it in half, basically. They, they cut the film in half and really kind of chucked the half that was cut out. And the weirdly, I, and I don't know how this happened, people are still theorizing about it. Somehow this Argentinian uh, company had said, hey, we want to we uh, play that film. Before it was cut, they basically got a copy of it and had the full version that, or pretty close to the full version down in Argentina that they had been showing on and off for years and nobody realized it. It was just kind of this closed in cinema file society that was watching it without realizing that it was this full version. Well, 
it got horribly, horribly damaged over the years. And then at some point, that version was sold to this or, or passed on to this uh, Museo del Cine Pablo Ducros Hicken in Buenos Aires, Argentina. <laughs> and they <laughs> they didn't know what to do with this big 35 millimeter film. So they copied it to 16 millimeter. And that's, pro- <laughs> that's where things go south. In, yeah, in the process of copying a really damaged film print, because by that point, it had played enough where it was just scratched to hell. It was really um, just a mess. Well, when they, um, when they copied it to 16, they checked the 35, but they still had the 16, so at least it exists, which is great, but... <laughs> What exists is really ugly because the, the scratches are essentially a part of the print now. There's no way you could do, uh, I can't remember what it's called, like a wet bath where you, uh, um, a wet print, I think, where you run the film through liquid and you take a picture of it and that helps kind of alleviate some of the scratch looks. You can't do that if the scratch itself is a part of the picture. Right, it's it got to be an actual scratch on the film. Right, it, it doesn't get rid of it. So... Um, so we do have quite a bit of this 16 millimeter negative now making up this 2010 restored version. And it's very noticeable when they do cut to it. Um, but that being said, they did a really good job cleaning up as best they could all of those bits. And the rest of it just looks pristine. It's pristine. I mean, it really is beautiful. And, and you know, you notice the the uh, the unclean stuff because the, the frame size changes a little bit and there are a lot of scratches uh, it, it's pretty much like you're looking at it through a, a moving screen door. Uh, but it's, it, it is really, uh, the rest of it is just gorgeous. Really and pristine. This, Except think, for there's one sequence when she, they're coming downstairs or something and, and there's a hair, there's a hair like blowing across the bottom of the frame. And I'm thinking they did so much work. Nobody saw the hair. <laughs> Nobody saw the hair. I guess I didn't either. I missed the hair. I'm gonna have That's to do funny. a screenshot of the hair, but the um, the I think there's only one part that I recall that is actually still missing, and it's I mean, unfortunately, it's kind of a critical story point when uh, when uh, Maria manages to finally escape the clutches of Rotvang and flee. And uh, that's kind of one key element that uh, is missing still. But at least, you know, in the restored version, they have some some screen, uh, some text on the screen that they kind of use to kind of fill in those plot holes. So you still get a sense of what's happening in the story. Um, how did it uh, how did it end up doing when it was released? Do we have I mean, do you have any numbers or, or any initial award information or is it just are we past that point? You know, I actually do have a little bit of information, not a ton. It's it's tricky tracking some of this stuff down for these old films. But this film, um, it took a 310 shooting days of, of uh, making this film from some point in 1925 to some point in 1926. It was a very long process making this movie. Um, initially, it was 1.5 Reichmarks it was the budget for this film, which inflated to 5.1 million Reichmarks. Is, so, this the, is this the first time you've had to do uh, Reichmark, Reichmark conversion? conversion? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, converting um, 1927 Reichmark dollars to, or <laughs> Reichmarks to dollars, yes. It was, a, it was quite a feat, but, wow. but I did it. I did wow, it. Wow, Andy. So, yeah, 5.1 <laughs> million Reichmarks is what this film ended up costing, which was about $1.2 million at the time, which in today's <laughs> dollars is about $16.2 million. <laughs> I love you. Look at that. Your spreadsheets. (laughs) That's awesome. Where do you find the Reichmark uh, rates? That's not something that is calculated. There there was a, a, I mean, you search the internet, you can find all sorts of things. (laughs) It was like this historical thing that showed like Reichmark to dollar um, uh, trans uh, or or, uh, um, conversion exchange rates from. Uh, like all through the period when Reichmarks were around. So it's amazing. I know, it's weird things that people put out there on the internet. Thank you, internet. That is it. Yes. Yeah. Love the uh, internet. Ho- hopefully it's right. <laughs> That's yeah. the only thing. It's like, I assume it's right, but I don't know. Um, the budget. Um, so that's the budget information. So um, all told, it ended up uh, um, doing 
not too great for itself. Um, that was the harder thing to pin down. I really had to struggle with some of the numbers because nothing agreed as far as what the film actually made at the box office, other than the fact that it looked like it lost money initially. Um, best guesses. This is all best guesses, but here in the U.S., it made about $92,000. Uh, domestically mm-hmm. and internationally about $17,000. So um, all told, that's an adjusted total gross uh, of about $1.4 million. So that gives it a loss of an adjusted profit per finished minute of a negative $96,600. That being said, with the releases over time and the restorations and everything, The film, it looks like it's made its money back, maybe. It's so hard to tell because, you know, looking at something from 89 years ago now, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really wishy washy as far as, uh, the finances are concerned. But best guesses, it didn't make its money initially, but I think that it's, I think it's okay now. But, you know, it's regarded a classic. So I think that's the trade off with some of these, um, films from the period. It's, it's, you know, It may not have done that well, but now people look at it as this film that has really uh, done a lot for the history of the industry and and this type of storytelling. So I, I think that in the end, this film will always be remembered for that, regardless of whether it ended up making money at the box office. I'm glad we watched it. I'm glad we're kicking it off with Fritz Lang. I, what self-respecting film podcast can call itself a self-respecting film podcast without bringing up Fitz, Fritz Lang? So now we've started. I guess we should probably rank it. Let's do it. I have a feeling this is going to be full of hate crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we shall see. I mean, in the end, I really enjoy watching this film, but I have so many story problems with it that um, uh, it's it's a tricky one to judge because it represents a lot of interesting things in film history. Um, I have problems with the story, but at the same time, it's kind of a mesmerizing film for me to sit and watch in whichever the 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 restored version or the Marauder version. I can easily sit and watch either of them, but. It's not something that um, I would call a favorite. So, yeah, we'll see where it goes. All right. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. Sign in. Search for Metropolis, not the Marauder version. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. And uh, and drop it into your flick chart. Let's see where it goes. Uh, Filmo a Filmo. Metropolis versus. First up, we have It's the O Brother block again. Metropolis O Brother, where art thou? See, here's the problem that I think we're, I'm going to find with Metropolis is that I can really see how other filmmakers have learned from it and moved on to make things that are more interesting to watch. And Oh Brother is one of those. <laughs> Although I, I don't know if I could pinpoint something from Metropolis that the Coens pulled in well, the I, making there of were Oh Brother. Tra- there were trains. <laughs> there were trains. Sure. <laughs> Come on. And people in uniforms, like uh, workers' yes. uniforms. Right, right. Yeah, I, I'm totally going to say, oh, brother, also. Yeah. Metropolis or Taxi Driver? Again, the parallels between uh, Metropolis and Taxi Driver are many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm going to be is, Taxi Driver on this. Is Robert De Niro the heart? Is he the mediator? <laughs> He's grot. Between, between the, the prostitute and the politician? Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That I'm is so, so glad. Funny. I'm so glad you saw that. Yes, I, I'm going to say Taxi Driver. All right, uh, Metropolis or the Hudsucker Proxy. I am Metropolis. Really? Yeah. Oh yes. Oh god. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but look at me. I'm so surprised. <laughs> Andy, the shock. I'm going to take you to the mat on this one. Well, you know what's interesting, though, before we do, uh, this is actually the first film where I will say I can see some elements pulled from Metropolis in in the film that we're uh, um, up against here. Absolutely. The city, the cityscape, the tall buildings and everything. Workers versus the, you know, the those down below versus those up above, the mediator between the two. In fact, you might be able to say, one might be able to make the case that the Hudsucker proxy, Angie, Andy, is an homage to Metropolis itself. Yes, you could. So is Taxi Driver. (laughs) 
HUD Soccer Proxy, <laughs> you, you won't hear this on any other podcast. HUD Soccer Proxy is a better homage to Metropolis than Taxi Driver. And so it is written. <laughs> and there I disagree. So let's take it to the bat. All right. You ready? <laughs> yep. One, One two, two, three. three. Heart. Scissors. <laughs> <laughs> Scissors stabs heart. <laughs> all right, all right. That's we should have done that. We should have done it. We head, we hands, do, and heart. This, exactly. We need to come up with a whole new uh, uh, rock, paper, scissors. That's right. Just for this film. All right. So is Metropolis taking it then? Yes. Metropolis or seconds? I mm. really love seconds. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm seconds. Yeah, I'm going to say seconds. All right, Metropolis or Christine? Little John Carpenter action. I'm uh, going to say Metropolis. I'm Metropolis on this one. Metropolis or The Untouchables? The Untouchables. Uh, I had more problems with it on this watch, but I'm still going to say The Untouchables, yeah. Metropolis or Ninochka? I'm going to say Metropolis. I'm Metropolis. There we have it. 201. 201. That's okay. It's this is one of those films where I I feel it's a classic for a lot of reasons and it's very watchable but uh, and you know I think 201 in this case is respectable. I think it's a it's a good place for a a very interesting film that I I I uh I don't know. I think a lot was pulled from this film, but and I, you know, I, I definitely will have problems with it forever, but I also feel it's a very important part of film history. I do too. I, you know, I'll tell you what, more than anything else, this film really made me want to go back and watch Snowpiercer again. The the whole idea of the people who, the machines that can't run without the people. Uh-huh. That's a, that's, that was my Snowpiercer connection. Not to mention the production design, uh, which I feel falls very close in line with, with Metropolis. I, I'd always seen the connection to things like, you know, Blade Runner and, uh, but I, I, Snowpiercer was a pleasant connection for me. What is your, what, let's talk about that briefly. What is your favorite, like when you watch this, what's the film that you see the most uh, as an homage to it that's not Blade Runner? Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, weirdly, I feel like it falls, and it's not a film, but it's it's um, the Express Yourself video by Madonna, oh. which is <laughs> really a direct reference to this film. Um, so I don't know if that's fair because it's such a direct kind of homage to it. But I mean, that move, that music video, like when I first watched this, I'm like, wow, that's where Madonna was pulling all this from. <laughs> uh, and she's definitely not the first music video or the last music video to pull a lot of imagery from the film. Um, outside of outside of her and that, hmm, that's interesting because Blade Runner is the one that pops to mind. Well, of course, I'm actually surprised you didn't say Brazil. Most of the themes around the city and the the workers, and that's a, a pretty direct homage for your very favorite. I, I'm almost embarrassed I didn't say that. I, I really should have. <laughs> I really have no excuse <laughs> to have not said that. I just was, uh, I don't know, you threw me with the question and I wasn't prepared. And so my mind went blank. I like that you pulled Express Yourself, though. That is not one that I would have uh, that I would have seen. The ones that that kind of jump out at me, I I don't know. Somebody, this is not my connection. Somebody made the connection to me that Joe versus the volcano was essentially a remake of of Metropolis, and I didn't see it at all for the longest time until now. And now it's all I can see. You know, with the the I don't know the tribes people and the. Uh, you know, and the doctors and the guy between the two and I don't know, business and you know, you know the story. That's interesting. It was that. And then, uh, you know, Batman, pretty much Gotham, the whole concept of Gotham City is one that that uh, stems, I think, from many of the themes around uh, uh, that are explored in Metropolis. Considering this is a Fritz Lang series, we did a very poor job of talking about Fritz Lang so far. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but, I mean, he is a very expressionist filmmaker, and especially at this point in his career, I think that's definitely something to uh, to just mention. And we can certainly talk about that more as our series progresses. But Fritz Lang and uh, the expressionist style that he develops here and in some of his other films... I definitely think became a key element in some looks for production design in films that would come later, especially big cities like Gotham, like Brazil, like any of those sorts of films where 
um, the city is this massive, uh, massive place. Uh, dystopian futures definitely are going to have a lot of that sort of look. And, and we already talked about um, Blade Runner, but it's really going to be running all through any of those sorts of films. And you're going to be able to pull them all, uh, bring them all back to uh, this film. Well, and look at, uh, for example, Alex Proyas, Dark City. Uh, There's another one, yeah. that that has not only the city as a major kind of monolithic character, but it also has you know the practically the thin man in it. Uh, you know, just about everything is is. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised there. if he's named Mister Thin. Yeah, right. Or right. Like Mister Something or other. Yeah, but. exactly. Uh, so anyhow, well, it, you know, Mister Hand. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, Mr. Hand. <laughs> there, right. Is there a Mr. Head? <laughs> uh, no, Mr. Book, Mr. Wall. I don't see any of that. Mr. Rain. Uh, but definitely Mr. Hand. I, I think it's great. I, I love that we're doing this, and we will talk more about uh, the works of Fritz Lang. Where do we go from here? Well, we're going to be uh, continuing our, you know... <laughs> This is a series of a lot of M movies directed by Fritz Lang, except for this next one, which is Spies. Uh, how did how did that escape us? Shouldn't we have intentionally chosen only the M's? Uh, we could have, but yeah, I, I like doing the one of these things is not like the other, and uh, <laughs> that would be Spies uh, or Spione, which came out uh, a year after Metropolis. This is 1928's uh, Spies. So it's have you have you seen this one? I haven't. I, I haven't. haven't. I have I, you not know, either. I think this is going to be the first uh, film that may have come to my attention because of Stephen Smart and uh, the hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. Oh, fantastic. So there you go. Thank you. Kudos. Uh, Games to, Master. Exactly. Kudos to Mr. Smart for bringing this one up and uh, ending up getting it added to our list. Before we have our uh, next Fritz Lang, we have another short coming next week. This is The Mind Bender with JJ and Tommy. That hits on uh, Tuesdays. Looking forward to that. And then, uh, obviously, Spies on Thursday next week. And I, I think next week we can plug this. We're doing our listener's choice drawing next week, aren't we? We're doing it next week, yeah. So we're <laughs> going to – I think what we're going to do is uh, put up a little something on Facebook and uh, and start getting some people to uh, throw some ideas out there and uh, get people interested who want to potentially be in the drawing and uh, see who, uh, who we can uh, pull from that. That'll be a good one. Looking forward to fun. it. Yep. Absolutely. That's it, Andy. I, after this one, I really, really have to go to bed. No. Number 11811, return to the machine and forget that you ever left it. Understood? All right, Andy, Amazon giveth. Oh, I'm so excited. This is so timely after our last show. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how excited I am. For those who haven't listened to the last show, we did Captain America Civil War, in which Andy gave it a review that went something like this. I love the stunts were five stars. I thought that the direction, the Russos were five stars. I want to have them over for dinner. Uh, I want to go on a date with Black Widow. Uh, I give the movie two stars. <laughs> and it was it was the most over the top to, to, over the top to middling review I've ever heard. It was really funny. And so here Amazon doth giveth from Snakeburn, who says, one of the best movies ever produced. If you have never seen it, do it yourself a favor and watch it. Incredible movie. Three stars. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm right there with you, brother. <laughs> it's so delightful. <laughs> so oh, funny. What's yours? Well, X says it is a perverse, unholy abomination that has no business existing. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the escaped deranged maniac who thought this deserves a Blu ray release? Only watch if you are being paid to do so and are totally inebriated and have a living will slash life insurance or are on suicide watch. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny. So That's funny. awesome. Thank you, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. 
If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. <laughs>